Can everybody see my screen? We can see your Facebook screen. There we go. Yep. All right. So let's get started with today's training. Today's free online Zoom training. Guys, welcome to Safe Splash Pad Services, uh, Surfaces, uh, sponsored by Space Coast Pool School. A little bit about me. My name is Lauren Broom. I own Space Coast Pool School. I'm a provider uh, for the Pool and Hot Tub Alliance nationally recognized certified pool operator CPO courses. I offer in-person classes anywhere within Florida and also private classes. If you ever need private classes, let me know. Don't be scared to ask. And I also offer 100% online CPO courses anyone in the world. So if you want a private online CPO class as well, welcome to contact me. There's my info, my website, and my phone numbers there as well. So if you ever need CPO classes, um, let me know. But I wanna now get to our main presenter for this presentation on safe splash pad services, Mary Ann Efert with Life Floor. Welcome, Mary Ann. Thanks, Lauren. And Amazing. I'm gonna pass it off to you now. All right, let me see if I can get my screen to share. And there we go. Can everybody see that? Yep. Excellent. Okay, well, Lauren, thanks for setting this up, first of all, and thanks for everybody who's joined us. Um, just a quick overview of Life Floor. Some of you mentioned you know what it is and you love it. Some of you are unaware, but have yep. some aquatic safety concerns. And so, um, we, we started the company about nine and a half, almost 10 years ago. Um, and, and really our mission has been, and it sounds a little hokey, but we believe that all splash pads should be beautiful and safe. And the majority of splash pads look like this picture here. Um, you know, a bunch of fixtures, kids running around and typically broomed concrete, maybe painted concrete. Um, and you know you look at the the playgrounds of the 70s and that's kind of what they looked like there was no safety surfacing there were monkey bars and things to climb on and jump on and and usually asphalt or rock hard dirt underneath and and nothing that really protected kids from injuries um and then in the 80s the uh, consumer protection agency passed um, regulations requiring AT, uh, astm servicing for playgrounds saying, hey, there's a lot of kids that are out there getting hurt and, you know, we need to do something about the broken arms and sprained wrists and legs and cracked heads and everything. And, and so, you know, we need to put some regulations in. And so they did that in the 80s for playgrounds. And now you see a lot of playgrounds that look, you know, more like this, possibly with some rubber mulch or maybe, you know, some thick layer of wood mulch, but something that's cushioning for when kids fall. Um, but, you know, everything fell short. What happened to, you know, uh, splash pads? Nobody really thought about what happened to splash pads. And so when we formed the company, you know, we got very involved in looking at what is the safety surfacing and what is the current surfacing for splash pads. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we can, we can, you know, compare the different surfaces that are out there. Concrete, um, which is most common, very abrasive, slippery, it's porous, it's hard to clean, often requires resealing or repainting, um, especially here in Florida on a very regular basis. Um, brick, very much like concrete, abrasive, porous, hard to clean, um, even have to regrout it sometimes. Wood, I don't know why anybody would do wood, but those are mostly platforms really for slides. Um, same thing, and then of course you've got absorbing mold and splinters. Bonded rubber seems to be the more popular safety surfacing of choice. People are finally starting to recognize that, hey, we need something. Um, and it's this pour in place type bonded rubber. The interesting thing is that that has evolved from the playground um, industry and is not really adapted well into the aquatics industry um, because of the chemicals and things used with splash pads and pools. Uh, it tends to break down rather quickly when it breaks down. Um, you know, you get peeling when you try to patch it. It doesn't always match. Those little pebbles get stuck in your filtration system. That causes a whole nother set of problems. And so while it is a good safety solution, it's not the best safety solution. And then, you know, there are some people, believe it or not, that use ceramic tiles. Um, as a matter of fact, I know of a project right now that say they're using ceramic tiles 
over on the west coast of Florida. And I'm like, I hope you have a hospital right next door and a good lawyer on staff. Because when ceramic gets wet, it is slippery and hard and people get hurt. Um, and so, you know, we started influencing the industry. We went to NSF, which is, you know, the be, a, be all and end all of pool and aquatics and said, you know, we wrote a white paper. It said splash pads need safety sur surfaces. Essentially, splash pads are <coughs> play playgrounds plush water, excuse me. <clears throat> so we worked with NSF on, um, you know, developing a new standard for safety surfacing for splash pads. And the standard was actually passed last year. Um, and it now states that all splash pads should now include a surface that is both cushioned and slip resistant without being abrasive. Again, splash pads equals playgrounds plus water. Uh, what is considered a splash pad? You see a picture here of this beautiful multi-level structure. Um, it's really anything that is, sorry about that, went too fast. Um, really anything that has water fixtures and things on it, and then you could have a tower or a dump bucket like that, that water is continually running across. Um, the guideline for safety and, and how the NSF standard affects different states, there's five states that we use the word require, it actually is a code. It follows code in five states. And those five states are New Hampshire, Delaware, um, Texas, South Carolina, and Oregon. Those, those blue states that are high, highlighted there. And so their code follows the NSF ANSI standard and recommends as be best practices that you use an NSF certified product. Um, and then there are 28 other states that reference it, but don't require it. And then eight states that reference the standards with four more that have counties that reference it. So it hasn't quite caught up nationally yet, but the best way I can describe it is it follows the model of health, aquatic health code. And even if it is not code, it is considered best practice, which minimizes your risk for liability if someone gets hurt. Because the question that always comes up when there is a lawsuit involved is, do you know about the standard? Did you know about a product? Why didn't you use it? And most often an answer is, well, you know, it wasn't in the budget or we didn't have the funds or whatever. And that really doesn't limit you from liability. Um, we have had, since the standard is passed, we have had several insurance companies with some theme parks that have actually reduced the, in, the theme parks um, insurance prices by using our products. So it, it's kind of like, okay, we know you're going to use a safety surface. You're not going to have nearly as many incidents. So we know we're not going to have to pay out as much. Um, so that is kind of the thing. The standard entails six key criteria. The key criteria are slip resistance and impact cushioning chemical resistance, UV resistance, cleanability, bacteria resistance, and impermeability. So, you know, we want kids to play. We want kids to run around on these splash pads. We don't want, you know, only wear water shoes. We know kids are going to wear bare feet. We know they're going to run. We know they're going to jump. We know they're going to play. We want to make sure that everything about that surfacing is safe for the kids to play on. Um, and those were the six standards that, you know, the NSF decided were the most important for safety surfacing. Um, this is just a, a copy of our, our certification. Right now, Life Floor is the only product that is certified to this standard. There are no other products that have been certified to this standard to date. I'm sure there are plenty of people trying to catch up. Um, best pat practices for compliance. Uh, this is just a link and I can send it to you privately if you like uh, to what this new standard is, what it covers. Um, obviously, the best practices are to determine how many spaces you have, which should be covered under the standard. And obviously, the slip and falls and ones where you've had incidents are probably the foremost ones that you should pay attention to. And then review all the products that are certified to the standards. Another one, again, we're the only ones certified to the standard. 
And then obviously, you know, your due diligence is your timeline and your budgeting and, and getting it through council. Um, and having done this for a while, I know what a challenge that can, can be. Um, we are the only comprehensive flooring solution specifically for barefoot activity and aquatic environments. Uh, and so there really isn't, you're not sacrificing one for another. When we talk, you know, a few slide backs about the different types of coatings and, and surfaces for splash pads that they are, all of them fall short on one of the six criteria. For us, we mat, meet all six criteria. And um, that makes us an industry leader in safety and product testing and creation. And we, we haven't just stopped because we got um, certification. We're actually continuing to grow our portfolio in colors and shapes and doing continual testing for more applications. Uh, we have an in-house studio and we work with many aquatics consultants and designers to help create the right products and designs and on time and in budget. We won the Kelly Ogle Memorial Safety Award in 2016. That award is typically not awarded to manufacturers, but rather to uh, municipalities or theme parks that have practiced safety within the industry. So that was a, that was a big win for us to get that award. Um, and, and of course, the safety is the most important. We're not only for splash pads though. Um, spray parks, splash pads are our biggest market by far, but we also manufacture thicker tiles that you can use for slide pads. Um, we manufacture thinner tiles that can be used for walkways and ramps. Slide towers, um, uh, there's a lot of multi-level play structures out there that have metal steps going up and landings and we've successfully covered those to prevent injuries for kids running up and down the stairs. Uh, zero depth entries where you have the, you know, that just little one foot, you know, from zero to one foot entry with a play area for the kids. We've successfully had installations there. And then of course, landings for swimming pools um, and even coping. At the moment, we have a palette of 30 different colors that can be mixed and matched in any combination you can imagine. We're adding some new colors next year, so that'll be something for us to see. We have two different textures. We have the Ripple, which is at the top, and that has the highest slip resistance rating um, when wet. And then we have Slate that's at the bottom. The Slate is typically used in locker rooms and uh, changing areas and places where people want just a little bit more aesthetically pleasing look and, and kind of mimic tile. Ripple is most often used for pool decks and spray pads. Um, we can create a variety of different shapes. Standard shapes are our squares, our triangles, and our rectangles. Um, and then we also make hexagons and that's an example of a recent installation in Texas. We have design inlays. We have standard inlays that you see here, crabs, fish, bubbles, starfish, large fish, seashells. Um, and really it's just a tile within a tile. Um, but it, it's interesting how they can be used to create interactive play areas. Um, in the case of the pandemic, it could even be used as spacers rather than having stickers that say six feet apart. Um, this is an example of an overview of a layout that we did for a splash pad at Cedar Crest. Um, I think that's Ohio, not 100% sure. But uh, this, is, this is what it looked like on paper and then you can see what the overlay looked like in person. What was really cool about this is that when this was, oh, this is, I'm sorry, it's Bloomington, Minnesota. When this was completed, the residents actually thought it was a brand new splash pad. But if you look very closely, you can see that the, the fixtures kind of haven't been paid in and are sort of outdated. Um, but still, the residents thought, wow, this is brand new. Look what you did for the community, et cetera. And all we did was just resurface it and make it safer. Uh, we've done some things in some major theme parks. This is out in Legoland in California where we incorporated some of their Lego fish and some of their stars and you can put them in different directions. 
And you see how kids just like to run around the swirls. Um, this is an overview of a huge water park in Dubai. Um, and as you see from here, from the actual installation, it's very uh, three dimensional and it looks as if it gets deeper as they've blended the colors, but it's actually all just about one foot water depth. So um, very cool. Our designers can do some very cool things to incorporate some play elements into just a standard design. Uh, Westfield got the uh, backside of a, of a octopus. And so it's all done using our two by two tiles and gridded out. We've got a great certified installation company that, that does the majority of our installations so we can provide turnkey solutions. Um, and uh, that's, that's the layout and then that's the actual look. So it's, it's kind of interesting. When you look at the layout, they look a little black to me, but then when you see them in per person, there's like a wow factor to them. So this turned out, they love that. Um, again, pool decks, this is a pool deck. Um, we do suggest to use three or more colors. Um, one color tends to get very monochromatic and you tend to see everything that falls on that splash pad, any of the imperfections or any of the seams or joints between the tiles, you tend to see it if it's all monochromatic. But you can see it looks very seamless if you blend three colors and more um, and then offset them so it doesn't look like a, just a, a plain grid. You're actually doing a staggered, much like a tile installation. Um, here's, here's one we did here in Florida. The, on the left is, uh, is what it looked like with a pour in place and you can see all the parts that were peeling and looking terrible. They told me it was about two years old. And then on the right is the overview layout of how we um, designed a pirate theme because they were doing all pirate fixtures and things. Um, we don't charge for that design. We have our in-house studio team create renderings based on um, what the client provides us. So sometimes I go back and forth a lot. This is another installation here in Florida, Fun Spot, where we have the capability of uh, being able to incorporate a logo into the splash pad. This has worked well with a lot of splash pads that have been sponsored by outside entities and communities. For example, um, we, we did one in Clarksville, Tennessee, that was a Rotary International, and we, we incorporated the Rotary logo in the middle. Um, we're doing a similar one for the Rotary in Swanee, um, Florida. And, uh, you know, they're, they're paying for it, or they're paying for a portion of it, and so having their logo for them means a lot. Just, uh, just some thoughts, food for thought. Um, we have some pre-made themes um, based on the popular popularity of color combinations and a lot of people are not very creative and, and tend to go to the high tide which is just a blend of blues that you know look like the water um, and then I think the one on the top left and the bottom right are probably the two most popular color blends seashore um, which looks beachy and then high tide that obviously just looks like the water um, but, you know, with 30 colors, we can almost incorporate anything. I've, I've done some where we've incorporated some of the colors of the fixtures and just kind of randomized it as it was installed. Um, and we've gotten very creative in how we can do the blends. Um, we can do them, as we said, in different patterns. You got your, on the top is just your standard um, three or four color just grid layout with squares. Then the middle is our, is our incorporating some triangles in there to give it a gradient look. And then the bottom shows how we can do even curves and swirls. And each layer, obviously, the more intense the design, the more expensive it becomes. We also have depth markers and safety messaging. So if you were wanted to do a pool deck rather than have to use tiles, for, uh, for the messaging, we can certainly incorporate life floor into, into the pool deck. We can do coping and actually wrap the coping with the thinner material that we make. And uh, I've got a few clients that are using an exterior around a kiddie pool where the kiddie pool actually is still concrete surfacing or, or plaster surfacing like a pool 
but they've done a 10 foot walk around on the outside because that's where the kids are running and playing. And depending upon the city or the county, you sometimes have a code that requires messaging. And so we are able to incorporate the messaging into the life floor tiles without upsetting the integrity of the, uh, of the project. Transition strips. We get a lot of questions about, you know, what if about, what if it's an existing um, spray pad or an existing surfaces? You know, how do how do we maintain the ADA requirements and still get the water to flow to the drains? Well, we have transition strips that allow us to sort of ramp down into the drain or into a walkway or, as you see, even around a deeper drain where we can pad. So never an issue with that. Um, we can also make drain covers. And what they do is they do that on site. They back bevel it. So it has a little bit of a catch. They don't glue it in, um, but it's back beveled so that you can pull it out and access the drain and be able to clean out the drains um, as required by your maintenance schedule. So I think that's a, that's a cool feature as well. Um, talked a little bit earlier about coping and wraps and that's how we do some stairs and, and edge pads for pools and uh, any piping that might be around the pool or the coping itself. So we have the capability of doing that. Um, our website is just a wealth of in inspiration. Uh, we've got CAD and Illustrator on there if you wanna do your own designing. Um, all of our spec resources and the color charts and the tech specs and all of the information you need to make an informed choice about um, our products. We're made in the United States um, in beautiful South Dakota, which is a place I do not want to go this time of year. But uh, every, everything that we manufacture is manufactured in conjunction with our, our partner Falcon Plastics and it's manufactured here in the United States. Um, and, uh, because we have a bunch of different tiles, um, we, you know, have the capability of, of getting things to you timely. Um, we did increase capacity last year and we are continuing to work on our R and D. We have, as I mentioned earlier, we have a preferred certified installation partner, Inside Edge. They do the majority of our installations worldwide. Um, we do a lot of business with cruise lines and cruise ships. Um, and of course that industry is sort of, sort of dead now, but uh, they, uh, they um, you know, they go all over the world for us. And the nice thing about being partnered with them is that they have, over 300 crews um, that they can use throughout the country to perform these installations for us. Um, and by having them certified and preferred, two things have happened this year. One, um, they offer a much better warranty. They offer a two year labor warranty versus typical one from anybody else who may do an installation. And two, because they are certified and preferred under us, and because we are the only product that is certified under NSF 50 right now, municipalities have had the ability to uh, use our product under the sole source um, budgeting. And so it didn't have to go out to bid, you were assured the best price and the best service and the best warranty. And um, I have some documentation on that if anybody would like to do that. And then I don't think there's anybody on the call from outside of North America, but if there is, we do have, um, we do have relationships as far as Dubai and Australia, as well as Canada um, in North America and Mexico. So um, just, you know, reach out, I'd be happy to provide you with that information. The last thing I want to leave with you is before your questions is we are in the middle of a make a splash contest um, and it is ending the end of this month. Um, basically, you have the opportunity to win for your municipality an industry leading all expenses paid splash pad. Um, we are actually going to give away three prizes. The first one will be free. The second one will be a 50% discount. And the third one will be a 25% discount. All we ask is that you give us a little, a little blurb about why, you think, why your city should win, 
Um, you send us some floor plans and a couple of photos if it's an existing splash pad and along with the entry form. And uh, we're going to pick the winners on January 15th. It is, it's a no obligation. Everybody who enters this contest is going to get a free design of their splash pad. Um, and uh, to give you sort of an overview of how we work, if somebody says to me, hey, Marianne, we're thinking about redoing our splash pad, what do you need? If it's an existing, well, regardless of its existing or new build, the first thing I need are scale drawings that shows me exactly what I'm looking at um, and exactly what the square foot will be. Um, if it's an existing splash pad, photos of the existing splash pad from a variety of diff different angles help with the scoping and being able to determine what the installation costs will be. Things like, do we need to remove paint? Do we need to remove pour in place? Are there some unusual situations at drain or with drains or anything like that? Once I have those two things, um, I then ask you, do you have any ideas as to colors or themes? Most people do not. If you do, that's great. Makes it easier. If you do not, it is not an issue. I go to my studio team and I say, here's the layout with the scale. They want a pirate theme or be creative. They don't know what they want. And she creates between two and four different renderings based on the input that you gave me regarding color and or budget. That takes about two weeks. I send that back to you and I say, you know, are we on the right track or were you thinking something else? If we're on the right track and you give me, um, you know, I pick option A, then we send it to estimating, takes about another week, and then I give you a quote. Once you accept the quote, um, it takes about eight weeks for production because we do produce everything to order. Um, unless it's a, just a standard three color blend. And then sometimes I can speed that up a little bit because we sit on some of that inventory. Um, I, I don't want you to get scared away from the timing, but I do want you to be aware of, you know, the thought processes that go into creating these, these renderings for you. I also, I don't want you to get scared away thinking, well, you know, I'm not even going to think about this till next budget. It doesn't matter. Yesterday, I worked on one that isn't even going to happen until 2024. Um, you know, we try to put caveats in there and explain when price increases are going to come down the line and everything like that. But I mean, I have several projects that are a, a year and a half that I've, I've sat on quotes simply because either it wasn't ready or it didn't make the budgeting phase or, you know, we were searching for money or whatever. Um, but uh, please, please enter the contest. That's more important. And that sort of concludes my talk. So does anybody have any questions? And I can stop sharing now and everybody can see my beautiful face. Hello. Everybody's so quiet. Well, I know I have some questions. So what are the big safety risks that uh, property should worry about when it comes to uh, splash pad surfaces? Well, I, th I think there's there's probably two big risks and both are associated with slip and fall right and the two big risks are an injury from a slip and fall okay be it concussion be it broken bone be it bruised or scraped okay and then i think the second big risk that people forget is the potential for drowning you know when you've got a kiddie pool that's only a foot deep and it's got, you know, standing water and a kid does fall and potentially gets an injury. How quick is somebody going to get to that kid before they take in water? And so I'm working, I'm working with uh, the Florida Health Department and the Pool Safety Coalition to talk about how we can raise more awareness there. Because, you know, we all know somebody can drown in two inches of water, right? So there's kids that drown in their bathtubs. Mm -hmm. Every Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any other questions? Is there anything else that is special about surfaces uh, that do you guys install the features or you just do the flooring? We just do the flooring. We do not do the features. And, and I, would, I would urge everybody 
Um, on a remodel, it's easy. You've got your features in place unless you're redoing all your features. Most of the time you've got your features in place. You're just looking for a safety addition. This is the right safety addition. On the new builds, I would urge everybody to take a hard look at, at the features and the fixtures and don't sacrifice safety for features. There are a lot of people that, you know, we want the water cannons and the guns and all the things that are cool and fancy. And, and you know, just recently I had somebody say, you know, if we lose your, if we use your floor, we give up two fixtures. Well, I, I, I you know, I mean, what can I say to that? Fixtures are cool, but, I think safety is more important. I don't. I don't know how everybody else here feels about that, but. I see. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Nick has his hand raised. Is that Nick that's asking a question? Oh uh, yeah, I did have a question. I, you um, had your hand raised, so I thought. Yeah, you yeah. Have yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. All right. So I'm an engineer, so I do the, the design. What resources are there? And maybe it's on your website. Um, for um like basically how to install these, how to connect them to the concrete underneath or, or information like that. Yeah, um, on our website, if you go under the technical tab, there are all kinds of documents regarding that. I mean, to oversimplify it, what our certified team does is they, if it's in a, well, even if it's new, typically they grind the slab first um, to make sure it is is it is good and smooth and you know angled right towards the drains, all those other kind of things, um, and then they use a waterproof contact adhesive to adhere the tiles to the to the substrate. That's an oversimplification, but that's what it is. Gotcha. And, and as far as like thicknesses of material and different things, all that's available. Mm -hmm. in Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the standard for splash pad, the standard thickness for splash pads is three eighths of an inch, which gives you a two foot impact attenuation. I'm sorry, a one foot impact attenuation. And that's typically what's used on splash pads. For slide pads, we use a seven eighths because obviously people are shooting out of water slides into a, you know, the bottom of a pool. So we want something thicker and um, obviously ab uh, abrasion um, proof as well. And then uh, 3 16 thickness for wrapping things like stairs and landings and coping. We also make filler tiles so we can kind of ramp up the thickness to whatever thickness is needed for a certain required impact attenuation. So we've, we've done some like, you know, foot and a half highs on 10 foot diving boards and things like that. Cool, thank you. Okay. Hey, Marianne, uh, this is Chris Ryan. Um, I had a question about uh, fall attenuation and how it's measured. Yep. Um, you know, what, what, is, um, what are the measurements uh, when you're talking about the difference between life floor and concrete? So because that's the, the concrete's the most common. Right. You know, right. Uh, and it's measured by it's not it, it's measured by um, critical head injury. So at, at what height can a head injury or a serious injury occur um, uh, from impact? And concrete is four inches. And three eighths inch life floor tested at 12 inches. OK. So three times concrete um, and the standard, the new NSF standard requires eight inches. So we have, we're actually better than the standard right now. Interesting. Now, does that go up with uh, the thickness of the, the yep. panel? Yep, it, it grows expon <laughs> exponentially as you, as you grow the thickness of the tiles. Yeah, I've, I've seen the the uh, egg drop test, and it's, yeah. it's actually pretty interesting. If you had the video, it would be great to show the, uh, the team. So that, uh, yeah, that's, let me see, that's pretty let me, interesting. Let me see if I can find that. I can, I can see if I can find that. Yeah, that would be fun to share, Marianne. Yeah, let me, let, me just, uh, let me get out of that and see if I can find the egg drop test. I've not, not heard of the egg drop test, so that would be... I, you know, it's funny. When I send out introductory emails, I often send that 
that video to people. And I always try to see who's gonna, who's actually going to uh, open it, you know, because you never know when, when somebody sends you a blind email and uh, you don't know who they are, you are a little hesitant to click links. And I can appreciate that because I'm the same way. So all right, let me see if I can get you back up here and I can share this. So there was a question afterwards uh, while you're looking for that, uh, Marianne, in the yep. chat. Okay, and, here we go. Oh, uh, we'll do this first and then we'll, there's a, a couple questions in the chat box after. Okay. Can you turn the volume up? There we go. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll start it over. enough of that. That's cool. I actually do that. If you've ever seen me in a trade show booth, I actually do that in a trade show booth. I bring eggs and I bounce them all day and I encourage people to come in and, and bounce them. So good morning. Good morning. Glad to have everybody with us this morning. We've got some more folks that are going to be coming in uh, over the next few minutes, but we also have lots of our church family that's still out of town uh, with the Thanksgiving holidays. So oh, I guess glad that you chose to worship with us this morning. Thank Sorry you for being here. For those of you joining us I online, didn't, thank I you didn't turn off uh, YouTube. YouTube. Sorry about that. I was like, okay, who's coming in late? <laughs> <laughs> That's going, well, they brought the whole church with them. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> wow, I didn't realize I, I put it into a church Facebook group there. All right, so Rudy Stankowitz, he's another Pool and Hot Tub Alliance instructor on the training today. He had a question in the chat box that said, can you cover fecal release procedures on a splash pad, solid and diarrheal? Well, that, that would probably be more you than me. What I can speak to with respect to our tiles is that if you go back to the six criteria, the bacteria resistance and the cleanability are two, two of the criteria under the standard. The product is a closed cell um, EVA foam, so nothing can grow in it. Um, and cleanability was important because we wanted to be able to remove anything that potentially could be on the surface, which also ties into the chemical resistance. So when it was tested under the standard, not only was the, an individual tile tested, but also the joints between the tiles were tested to make sure that nothing could get in there and live and grow and thigh, thrive. And it was shown that with standard cleaning, either using our recommended cleanings or um, a bleach solution, that it was 99.96 reduction of bacterial matter or any. So that, that would probably be the question is, your surface is safe to use a certain, do you know what concentration of bleach that you can use that's safe to clean your surface that won't destroy it or change the coloring of it or anything like that, that would still kill like crypto? Yeah, off the top of my head, I wanna say it's 10 to one, but I'm not 100% certain. But again, one of the things that was important is knowing that we are in a pool environment, that there is constant fluctuations between chlorine and acidity, that also had to be tested under the standard. So, you know, we, we shocked it for, you know, 72 hours and then, and then raised it and, you know, changed the pH levels and things like that. I mean, obviously, if you're doing your part for disease prevention by keeping your chemical balance right, our tiles will be fine and we'll meet that standard and not break that, that covers the question that I had, Lauren. Yeah. It was more regarding the pad itself, not the treatment of the water in the um, surge pit. Yeah. We're okay there. All right. Thank you. 
No problem. I figured Rudy was asking more about the surface and what you could use yep. on the surface than the water treatment. And anybody else other than Rudy, because I know he knows. Everybody else in the in the audience, if you want to know more about uh, public health risks and if there's a fecal accident, go to my YouTube channel and I have my two hour presentation that I did for the Florida Parks and Rec Association that then I did as a training a month and a half ago online. Um, you can watch that and it'll go over the that part of it. So for Rudy's question was more about the surface itself with your surface. What can we do? What can we clean it with? If there's no water in that part of the splash pad that you can actually disinfect with the water, then what, what do we do? Which right. is what makes splash pads so interesting. They are very different when you're dealing with fecal accidents or anything else and water treatment even, and even the kinds of equipment that you'll find on it. Okay. Andrew's got his hand up. Yeah, I, um, I have a couple. What is the fade resistance? What is its resistance to algae growth and um, scale? And another thing is our, our, some of our splash pads are not supervised, so it's not unheard of kids, you know, riding their skateboards or bikes through. <laughs> so how durable are they? Um, you know, anything that has a sharp edge is, is going to damage it. I mean, it's a pretty sturdy... EVA foam, it's almost like, almost like the base of your sneakers. Um, the neat thing about the tiles is that if you, if you have like a tile damaged, it's, it's easy to repair a tile. It's actually fairly simple. Um, with regard to fade resistance, let me answer that question. Our brighter colors do tend to minimize in color after a little while, yet if, if it's continual water on it, and I don't mean at night, but I mean during the day, hot, bright sun, um, one of our testing was UV related to make sure the product did not break down. And so, you know, you don't want to compromise safety. Um, we performed very well. The product itself does have a five-year warranty. Um, we have some installations that are eight and nine years old and have not had any issues, but again, Brighter colors, especially like here in Florida or south of the Mason-Dixon line, do tend to minimize in color concentration slightly. Um, since the standard, we've actually had new enhanced UV additives to the product that helps with that, with that, uh, with that breakdown. And we do a lot of unmans. We just did an unmanned in, in Winter, Winter Haven um, earlier this year. And uh, it looks great. It looks as good as the day we put it in, in the beginning of the year. So, and that one at Fun Spot is two years old now, and that looks fabulous. So, does that answer your question, Andrew? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So, is there any other questions that you may have for Mary Ann before we're done with the presentation? Hey, Andrew, um, I, I've, I'm experienced in the uh, alternative floorings for playgrounds and things like that uh, from a previous company I worked for. And <clears throat> all of the materials used have some um, degradation in, in color uh, from UV, um, but I'll tell you I've seen going back five six seven years now with life floor and they're still functional um, they still look great uh, they're you know um, it's just a really interesting durable product thanks for that Chris you want to come work for us <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> well when they worked with the product you know now, what, what made you guys, this is my question, what made you guys different in being able to get the NSF 50 standard than all the other splash pad surfaces? Why haven't they gotten that standards uh, set if it's, you know, part of the model aquatic health code and that kind of thing? What sets you apart from them and, and that standard and getting that standard? Well, I think that, you know, I think that they, they resisted for a long time. I mean, our, our CEO is very passionate about the safety aspect of the product. And he spent four years with NSF with that white paper that I referenced in the presentation, 
Um, you know, basically going back to what I said, you know, splash pads are, are playgrounds plus water. And we have safety regulations for playgrounds. Why don't we have them for splash pads? And, you know, of course, NSF, I mean, it's just not one manufacturer that can tell them what to do. It's like, okay, you know, if we're going to create a standard, it has to meet this criteria. It has to meet the Model Aquatic Health Code. We have to follow that. And, you know, what are the standards going to be? And it's not just like, oh, okay, Life Floor, you know, all these things you do are great. There are actually things we had to do to our products to make it better than what it was when we first started the process. And the, the competing manufacturers, first of all, there is no other product like this out there. Um, but, you know, the competing manufacturers were basically saying, well, why do we have to do that? Why do you want to do that? I don't want to do that. What, you know, and, and so they resisted and, and, you know, really kind of made it hard for us. And now that it, there is a standard, they're all trying to figure out how to catch up. But, you know, I mean, it's like anything else that's the first to the party, you know, so here we are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Does anybody else have any other questions for Marianne today? Otherwise, we will end the presentation and give I've, uh, Yeah, I've dropped my number and my... Uh, email in the chat if anybody would like to follow up with me. Andrew, I'd love to follow up with you one-on-one. -on -one. I'm actually based in Central Florida. Um, so um, be happy to, you know, meet with you and one-on-one -on -one go through some stuff. It sounds like you've got some things that you're thinking about. And anybody else who's on the call, just feel free to reach out. I'm happy to help. And anybody listening to the recording of this, since you probably won't be able to see the chat window, you can email me at spacecoastpoolschool at yahoo.com and I can send you her contact info um, after you've listened to her presentation on my YouTube channel or on Facebook Live. And I can certainly get her contact info to you if you want to speak to her more about safe splash pad surfaces. Thank you for being on my uh, Zoom training today, Marianne. Thank you for setting it up. I appreciate the uh, invite. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, everybody who attended. Yeah, education's a great thing. This Zoom thing, this online training, it's going to really open up the door for people to be able to uh, learn more. Um, probably coming in the next couple of months, I'll continue with the Splash Pad series and have somebody on ozone and somebody on UV. Um, for any of you guys that want to come in in the next couple of months for a couple more free trainings. I'll have Beth Hamill probably with uh, on ozone and uh, Mr. Sawardis with Aquionics on, on UV. So that look for my podcast. They'll be on there as well coming up in the, in the next year. But thank you everybody for being on today. And uh, it's been a pleasure. And you guys all have a wonderful day. You guys too. Thanks a lot, Lauren. Appreciate it. No, thank you, Marianne, and it was wonderful meeting you at the Florida Parks and Rec. Right, we'll connect again. Take care. You too.